Hi guys. Thank you for sticking with me as we get to chapter 13 of Peruvian Plunge where we're going to have a bit of a canopy breakdown at the Manu Wildlife Center in the uh, deep in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. We're going to kick off this story with a uh, quote from this little book called Becoming. Through the process of observation while experiencing the chaos, each awakening soul will be able to put themselves in positions that allow them to be in places of safety, not hiding, but in movement within the chaos. It is an experience of observing the self in movement, a process of literally being in two fields of awareness at once. And this brings us to Thursday, June 4th, 2009 at the Manu Wildlife Center. By Thursday morning, I had pretty much settled in to my double life at Manu Wildlife Center, alternating between my public life as a cheapskate tourist man masquerading as a volunteer English teacher, and my secret life as a spiritual warrior on a pilgrimage back to the canopy home of my ancient ancestors, from which vantage point I hoped to gain a first-hand McCall's eye view of the chaos swirling through the Amazon rainforest and, by extrapolation, the rest of the planet. A spectacular sun-washed afternoon in the jungle found me hiding out in the creek on a butterfly-carpeted beach, waiting for a bunch of rich eco-tourists to finish doing whatever it is that rich ecotourists do 10 stories up a kapok tree in the Amazon rainforest. From my secret hideout barely 200 feet from where they hovered above me in the treetops, I could hear the non-stop broken English prattle of their omnipresent hired guide, Miguel. I almost wanted to scream at the idiot and the idiots who hired him to shut the fuck up and just listen to the whisper of the forest for five minutes, but wisely decided to keep the following rant to myself. As the burgeoning Amazonian ecotourism industry has exploded over the past few decades, one ironclad rule of the game seems to be that tourists have to hire a guide to hold their helpless hands so they won't get lost in the jungle, bitten by a bushmaster, strangled by an anaconda, mauled by a jaguar, speared by a savage, or whatever the hell it is they are so damned terrified is going to happen to them on their summer vacation in the deep, dark jungle. I have been tromping around the jungle for years, usually barefooted, frequently butt-naked, never once in the service of a guide. Amazingly, I am alive to talk about it. One set of tourists at the lodge, overhearing that I had visited the canopy platform by myself, was flabbergasted. How did you ever find it? without a guide to show you where it was, the helpless woman asked me. Well, let's see. There was this bridge behind the cabins that led to a 10-foot wide trail that had signs saying, Canopy Tower, this way. Don't get me wrong. Depending upon what it is you want to get out of your jungle experience, there is a place for guides in the rainforest, just as there are a place for bars that serve frozen margaritas. If the sole purpose of your jungle vacation is to spot 
as many species of wildlife in the shortest amount of time possible than by all means hire a guide. I can guarantee you that you'll see more birds and monkeys than if you blunder off into the thick forest without one, unless, of course, yours truly is ahead of you on the trail, scaring away all the birds and monkeys. If, on the other hand, the purpose of your visit to the planet's lungs, heart, and soul is to scrape the rust off your link to spirit and have a long heart-to-heart -heart with Gaia, then trust me, dump the chomp. A guide can lead you to a toucan, but you'll stand a much better chance of encountering God if you go into the forest alone. And I do mean alone. I don't care if you're on your honeymoon or celebrating your golden wedding anniversary with your soulmate for life. You need to spend at least one day and preferably one night alone in the forest with Gaia if you want to have any chance of having a heart-to-heart -heart with her. Trust me on this one, guys. As I sat there alone in the creek having a heart-to-mouth conversation with a swarm of Gaian mosquitoes, I finally heard footfalls on metal as the group of eco-tourists descended the steel spiral staircase, their guide blabbing away all the while so they could make it back to the lodge in time to grab a hot shower and cold $7 mojito before their gourmet meal was served at 7. Once again, as I assume happens 365 days per year at Manu Wildlife Center, the canopy was abandoned at the very minute that the most magical hour of the day was just beginning. Of course, this was my cue to get my spider monkey spiritual warrior ass in gear and get up the tower to the treetops. I arrived at the platform at the precise moment that the golden rays of the setting sun began illuminating the giant broccoli crowns of the surrounding emergent jungle behemoths. A flock of seven boat-billed toucans winged their way home across the treetops as I fired up my daily bowl. One more reason, perhaps the most important reason, not to hire a guide and took three deep hits to put me in the groove with Gaia. I leaned into the chest-high wooden railing that encircled the 100-foot-high platform. I soaked in the glorious sight of a waxing moon floating silently like a silver spaceship above the sun-gilded crown of the enormous strangler fig spreading its arms above the canopy just to my east. The weed began its gentle sundown dance through my brain as the, evening, the evening's chorus of insects, frogs, and night birds began tuning up for the jungle night's ancient symphony. You've probably already figured out by now where this story is heading. As the sun's final rays painted the uppermost branches of the strangler fig in liquid amber and the chorus of the ancient forest voices kicked into high gear, the fucking fart of the Eco Lodge's gasoline-powered water pump ripped through the magic as it began to fill the tank that supplied the water for the tourists and my hot showers. That goddamn pump would sit silent as a stone all day long, bothering no one, then precisely during that magical quarter hour when Gaia blesses the forest with her gentle Icaros, that meditation mangling motor from hell and Honda would scream out its arrogant mechanical growl across the furthest reaches of the canopy. 
ripped from my sundown revelry for the third evening in a row. I paced in impotent rage around a little platform, trying in vain to banish this rude interloper from my ears and my life. In surrender, I sat down heavily and reached for my little stone jaguar pipe. I didn't stop sucking until I had polished off all six of the remaining hits. I crossed my arms across my knees and buried my face into the darkness of my folded forearms while the nine-hit freight train <clears throat> roared through my frontal lobes. When I peered out three minutes later, the swirl of giant branches with their riot of vegetation had come to life. I could actually see the leaves and the lichen-covered bark begin to swell and breathe and sink with the energy of the surrounding forest. <clears throat> From my sitting position on the platform floor, the chest-high railing looked eight feet high. The water pump from hell droned on and on, boring into my brain as I considered that damn railing for what it was, the last puny little man-made barrier between me and the naked tree itself, the final step that separated me from the mother I had been waiting to meet since the day I was born. I pulled myself to my feet and considered my tailless spider monkey options from my stoner's perspective. As I mentioned, the 8 by 10 foot two-tiered treehouse had been built into the crown of the jungle giant, whose humongous arms radiated outward from the center like giant spokes. The platform actually rested on top of four of these gargantuan branches, leaving the two southern branches to rise in one massive wall of wood, further anchoring the structure before dividing about six feet above the floor of the treehouse's second story. This fortuitous arrangement created a natural moss-covered saddle in the crotch formed where the two massive limbs forked off from each other, and it was this saddle that called to my cannabis-blessed spider monkey heart to come enjoy the unobstructed view from outside the protective prison of the railing. Why hadn't I thought of this obvious seating arrangement before? Hell, my acrophobic brain had survived the bus trip across the Andes on a cliffside llama trail. It should be able to survive this vertiginous challenge as well. Shakily, I climbed up onto the four-foot railing and sat there for a moment, testing the ground of the crotch <coughs> of the tree with my feet. So far, so good. The tree-hugging vegetation on the other side of the railing was so thick, it was hard to tell where solid wood ended and air began beyond the ferns and moss. It appeared that I had a secure wooden bench, perhaps 18 inches wide. Grabbing a smaller upthrust branch for support with my right hand, I slowly lowered myself off the railing and onto the tree. With the final goodbye to the man-made world, I let go of the railing. There I stood shakily, stoned out of my gourd and alone with Gaia, 11 stories now above the forest floor that my idiot ancestors had climbed down to reach a million years ago. It was quite a homecoming after all that time, gazing out over the darkening forest in three directions, not one sign of humanity could be seen. No part of my body, of my body touched a man-made structure 
no safety net or harness held me. It was just me, the trees, the birds, the monkeys, the moon, the weed, and one fucking loudmouthed planet drinking water pump from hell. I carefully lowered my ass to the soft seat of the moss and slowly began inching myself toward the forward, foot first, toward the 110 foot precipice. No doubt, partly due to my stoned condition, I overshot what I perceived to be solid wood. My left foot slipped through a fern and over the edge. For a split second, it felt like my whole body was going to fall on my foot all the way down. I fell backward and grabbed the first thing my hand came into contact with, a nasty sticker vine that sank two painful thorns into my right thumb as if to drive home the point that one cannot be too careful in the saddle of a kapok tree eleven stories above the ground. Shit! That hurts! Quickly rebounding, I sat up straight. Now that I knew where the real edge was, I inched forward again until both my legs were swinging freely from the knees down over the chasm created by the ramrod straight trunk. To call this feeling pounding from my brain to my toes exhilarating would be the understatement of the year. I was giddy with freedom, strangely energized by the knowledge that one small move on my part would send me over the edge to my death. But what a way to go for someone so damn bound and determined to live on the edge of life. <clears throat> as bound and determined as the infernal water pump was to ruin this perfect moment, I was equally determined not to let it. And while I can report that the motor did not ruin the moment, it did manage to clarify the moment for me. It told me in no uncertain terms that there is nowhere left on this planet that you can go anymore. No iceberg in Antarctica, no Kapok treetop in the Amazon jungle, or some fucking water pump, or honking horn, or chainsaw, or a little plastic bottle or bag isn't going to hunt you down and let you know that the planet eaters have won, and we're all nothing more than trapped lobsters with our claws taped shut waiting around to die in a slowly heating pot of water that most of us don't even realize is beginning to warm. This realization wasn't so much an epiphany as it was final, direct confirmation of a doom and gloomy worldview that was fomented three dozen years ago when that suburban white kid from Atlanta stumbled across that horrific photo in Life magazine showing that jagged red rip across the face of Mother Earth that was one of the first roads being smashed into the heart of the Amazon rainforest. As these thoughts swirled through my weed-tangled, untangled brain in the top of that K-pop tree in the countdown to my 50th birthday, the sadistic snarl of the water pump from hell finally, mercifully, left me in peace. The eons old chorus of the insects and the frogs resumed in the waning light of the sun. The first soft patina of moonlight began to paint the east-facing tree trunks a ghostly silver, and the twinkling red and green eyeball of Sirius winked at me from the southern horizon. 
I lay back on the soft mattress of moss so high above the forest floor and gazed at the ghostly silhouettes of the branches and leaves above me. There was nothing between the soles of my feet and the ground except 11 stories of air. One roll forward, and I would never hear the sound of a fucking water pump or a chainsaw again. I just rolled around in the loving arms of Gaia, letting my thoughts flow freely. All the times I had asked myself over the five months, what in the hell are you doing with your life? were answered in that one crystalline moment. I had quit my job, sold my house, left the people I loved for this one bittersweet taste of heaven. It was, and forever will be, one of the defining moments of my life. The second when I figured out on a cellular level that this planet is irrevocably doomed. How ironic, I thought, that I had reached this inescapable conclusion literally in the middle of one of the most beautiful moments of my life. I sat up slowly, took a few deep breaths, and fixed my gaze southward toward the Mother of God. I focused softly on the silvery trunk of a graceful kapok tree arching over the creek that bubbled below me. It seemed to quiver and quake with a life and energy of its own. As I sat gazing down from above onto the sublime sight, it was as if my whole body, from my throat to navel, just unzipped. The empty cavity of my chest lay exposed and open to the universe. The only way to begin to describe what happened next is to say that some arrow of pure, unadulterated grief. I am talking about a heart-wrenching, utter level of despair every bit as devastating and overwhelming as the death of a loved one or the death of your own mother shot straight out of the canopy three stories below me and slammed into my solar plexus once Twice, three times, these waves of grief rolled into my open heart chakra, filling me with such a crystalline state of despair that I was literally physically knocked backward into the crown of the tree as if I had just taken three arrows to the heart from Gaia, which, of course, I just had. I lay there stunned on my back, on my bed of soft moss to the top of a kapok tree in the Amazon rainforest, gasping for air to recover from the shock. Groaning in spiritual distress, I rolled over to my right side, which placed me face to face with a pumpkin-sized, heart-shaped burr of tree trunk that was poking up a few inches above the mattress of moss. Lovingly, tenderly, I ran my fingers over its cracked and wrinkled skin. With my breath beginning to calm from the arrow shots, I wrapped my arms around the heart-shaped protrusion of bark and gently laid the right side of my face against its rough surface. A spasm of spiritual nausea racked my body, yanking my knees upward and forcing me into a fetal position. But instead of erupting into a hydrant of psychic puke, as I half expected would happen, my body spewed forth 
a torrent of tears that could have flooded the mother of God herself flowing just a few hundred feet from where I lay in the treetops. I half choked, half howled my way through my tears, sobbing into the cracked heart of the giant tree, racked with inconsolable grief and the helpless despair of realizing what my own species has done to this beautiful planet. I begged forgiveness from Gaia for my own part in this mad matricide and tried to explain to her, as if she hadn't already figured it out on her own about 500 years ago, that despite appearances to the contrary, I honestly believe that the vast majority of my fellow humans are truly good at heart, but they have been so blinded by the planet eaters, not to mention by their own innocent culpability, that together we have arrived at the point of no return. Forgive them, mother, for they know not what they do. Indeed, Gaia swaddled me in her soft manger of moss between her upthrust loving arms, stretching halfway to the moon above me, and answered my anguished cries with her ancient chorus of crickets and frog song, similar to what she had done for me in a jungle hot spring on the side of a Guatemalan volcano four months earlier earlier, mother wrapped me in a loving state of grace with one subtle but glaring difference. When I had broken down in Guatemala, which I naively thought was as broken down as I could get until I really broke down in the Amazon, Gaia had soothed me and comforted me but she did not share in my grief. This time, the arrows of grief came from Gaia to me. For the first time ever, including my two five-gram forays into the mushroom kingdom, Gaia directly confirmed to me in unambiguous language that she too had reached the same conclusion that her own children have carried their madness beyond the point of no return, and it is now simply a matter of when, not if, we will destroy ourselves and our fellow planetary brothers and sisters. Of course, Gaia has been through this movie five times before, and she will probably go through it five times again over the next few billion years before Father Son fizzles out, taking her along with him into the void. <clears throat> Slowly returning to my senses, I sat back up and shook the cobwebs from my head. Catching my breath in the top of the jungle giant, it occurred to me that I had just enjoyed, endured with that tree the single most intimate encounters I had ever shared with another living being in my entire life, far outstripping anything I had ever shared with a human family member, including my own beloved mother friend, or a lover, I have no doubt that I will be able to say the same thing the day I die. Dirt-worshipping tree-hugger? You got that right! One of the senses that returned to me was the dawning realization that I was getting hungry, and it was probably almost time for my evening gourmet meal. I kissed the tear-stained heart of the tree goodbye, 
then negotiated my way back to the platform and down the tower. For the third straight night in a row, I let the lantern of the moon guide me through the tangled shadows of the dark jungle, and ten minutes later, I was back inside the posh dining room, surrounded by rich eco-tourists with their $7 cocktails, gorging myself on a heaping plate of fettuccine alfredo with black currant cheesecake for dessert. As usual, Miranda was at the table when I arrived. Thankfully, Kurt Sita, no doubt still fuming over the famous bird book incident, was not. I wasn't about to share my mind-blowing spiritual experience in the canopy with the innocent 21-year-old college student. Instead, I casually suggested to her that she might want to check out the canopy tower at sunset and moonrise, which would be coinciding over the next several nights. Oh, I'm not much of one for nighttime walks, she said, deftly deflecting what she no doubt assumed was a desperate ruse by a pathetic horny old fart her father's age to get her alone in the moonlight 100 feet up a kapok tree in the middle of the Amazon jungle. I checked out that canopy tower when I first got here a couple of weeks ago but decided all those touristy things, they're not for me. Touristy things. Bingo! There it was, perhaps the single greatest spiritual experience of my entire life reduced to the two words that describe 99.9% of eco-tourist experience in the rainforest canopy. Just one more of those touristy things. Despite the fact that Kurtzita Ratchetta had banned me from talking to or even looking at the, green, the rich gringo eco-tourist shelling out 150 bucks per day to enjoy what Condé Nast promised would be hands down, the most intense wildlife experience to be had in the Amazon, I slyly took every opportunity I could find to observe the bizarre behavior of Ecotouristicus americana in its native habitat, in this case, the prime habitat of Manu Wildlife Center. Of course, I conducted most of my surreptitious observations from my hidden blind on the creek bank below the canopy platform as I waited for them to abandon it. It wasn't so much the habits of E. Americana and the closely related E. Alamanes, E. Canadensis, E. Australensis, etc., that I observed during my 17-day behavioral monitoring that surprised or disturbed me, it was the non-habits that I did not deserve, that, that I did not observe that rankled my chicken little doom and gloomy worldview. While I was there, I observed perhaps 40 groups of Ecotouristicus Americana comprising some 150 individuals. Clearly not a solitary species. Never once did I observe a lone specimen straying more than six feet from its herd. They tended to travel in bonded male-female pairs or more commonly in small, tightly knit herds ranging from three to six individuals, though one herd of 14 and another of 12 were observed. As indicated already, 100% of the individuals 
from the bonded pairs to the herd of 14 appeared congenitally incapable of finding their own way through the forest, despite the existence of a network of 10-foot-wide, well-marked trails. Without the seeing-eye dog services of a hired guide to interpret and explain every minute detail of their rainforest experience in a ceaseless drone of broken English blather, this virtual hero worship devotion to the all-powerful guide, not one of whom were locals from the area, centered as it was inside a more centered as it was inside a more overarching structure of a general state of helplessness. I detected among the majority of E. Americana, even among the healthy young males of the study group, who you might expect, being primates, to exhibit some minimal form of self-determinant, goal-oriented initiative in such a tightly knit group setting, surprised and baffled me. After all, despite the obvious fact that their ultimate destination in the wilds of the Amazon jungle was the Peruvian equivalent of Club Med, Mother of God, the inescapable truth also remained that, despite appearances to the contrary, this Disney world in the jungle was in fact in the jungle hours away from the nearest road or airport, somewhere in their fear-filled bodies beat the heart of an intrepid explorer and lost pilgrim on the way back to Gaia. Somehow they, ma they had managed to find their way from their comfortable homes in Westchester or Malibu to this remote, if well-appointed, outpost of the jungle. That took a certain amount of moxie and daring do that set these pol that set these folks apart from the more mundane Machu Picchu masses. After getting that close to Gaia, their last minute decision to turn their lives over to some kid from Cusco to interpret their reality for them somehow saddened me, but didn't really surprise me all that much when I thought about it. Besides the touristy thing of the canopy platform, the other two items to mark off their Amazon to-do list included the McCall Claylick where dozens of macaws gathered each morning to be spied upon by those same eco-tourists willing to fork over yet another 50 bucks for the privilege of watching a bunch of birds eat dirt for breakfast, and the taper clay lick, where pampered eco-tourists could spy on the nocturnal mud wallowing of these butt-ugly miniature Peruvian hippos from the comfort of soft beds complete with mosquito netting, set up in a Walmart-sized blind in the forest. Of course, being the cheapskate volunteer English teacher that I was, I wasn't invited along on those forays, so I can't give you a first-hand report of how Ecoturisticus Americana interacted with these two exotic species. I had to satisfy my own curiosity about these jungle denizens by personally interacting with the hand-raised macaws and Vanessa, the apple-eating taper, who paid periodic visits to the well-equipped kitchen in search of handouts. Direct observation of the behavioral patterns of Ecotouristicus americana in the touristy thing habitat of the canopy platform was unfortunately greatly hampered by the fact that I could not visually observe them from my surreptitious hideout in the creek as I watched them as I waited for them to abandon their treetop perch. 
Likewise, I was too far away to differentiate their individual vocalizations. However, I was close enough and could hear just enough to bring you this report of how E. Americana reacted to their first and only visit to the treetops after they had probably spent a couple of grand to get there. At approximately 1600 hours, the day's little herd of sheeple would line up obediently behind their hired guide and little Bo Peep would lead them, wagging their tails behind them across the little bridge and into the woods. As far as I know, little Bo Peep never lost his sheep. This would be my stoner cue to load a bowl, pour my trusty pina colada, slather myself with deet, and head out the secret backwoods trail that would lead me to Butterfly Beach. The motley crew of tourists would generally arrive at the tower at approximately 1630 hours, and there they would remain for approximately a half hour. The details of exactly what they did up there for 30 minutes, besides listening to the ceaseless blather of their guides, of course, will remain shrouded in mystery. However, considering the fact that I never once heard one single individual member of E. Americana ask their guide to let them linger for the sunset or the moonrise, and furthermore, since I never one time witnessed the same group returning to the canopy a second time with or without a guide, I can only conclude that E. Americana's main purpose in traveling thousands of miles to get to this point was to check canopy platform off their touristy thing to do list in the Amazon before moving on to the next items, i.e. hot showers, slushy margaritas, and gourmet meals, no other explanation fits. It is this regimented, herd-like mentality with its attendant inability to think for oneself that keeps Ecotouristicus Americana and every other subspecies of Homo sapien so hopelessly disconnected from Gaia, while at the same time so hopelessly mired in the hoax of organized religion. So there they would stand, 100 feet up a kapok tree in the middle of one of the greatest temples to Gaia left on this planet, ground zero in the middle of her very heart and lungs, and they would choose to spend this gift from the universe by checking Canopy Tower off their list of things they had now accomplished in their busy lives and would therefore never need to accomplish again. Kind of like yours truly's reaction when I finally got to the top of Yona Mountain the one time I was stupid enough to go rock climbing in my life 30 years ago. I am not 100% sure of this, but I think I heard the female member of one pair bond say to her mate, okay dear, we've checked Machu Picchu, macaws, tapers, spider monkeys, and now canopy off our list. As soon as we check Stone Age Indian weaving basket in bamboo hut off our list tomorrow, we can blow Peru and start planning our next trip to Nepal or something like that. It was hard to hear over the prattle of the guide and the whine of mosquitoes in my ear, but that was the gist of what she said. In 17 days of observing Ecotouristicos Americana at Manu Wildlife Center, I never one time heard the vocalization spirit, much less the vocalization Gaia, leave anyone's lips there. In many ways, that is the saddest, most sobering, 
and most telling commentary I have to report to you from the banks of the muddy mother of God. And there you go. We have come to the end of Canopy Breakdown onward through the fog tomorrow. Bye, guys.